Everybody, thanks for getting up early on a Saturday. I appreciate it. Uh, so this panel, Religious Rhetorics of Resource Extraction, uh, brings together uh, three papers that use religious studies methodologies to elucidate discourses and practices that animate fossil fuel extractivism in North America. The papers together aim to disrupt, on the one hand, scholarship that isolates religion from broader currents of economic and ecological activity, and on the other hand, scholarship on energy and extractivism that overlooks religious and or spiritual knowledges. Resource extraction is always already religious in that it depends on scientific understandings of nature and human. Examining the religious rhetorics of resource extraction brings into clear view how coloniality and environmental injustices are rationalized, brings, uh, uh, and how societies imagine and pursue their energy futures, how burgeoning religious nationalisms and novel forms of socio-political domination are linked to energy extraction. So uh, we have three papers today, uh, Judith Brunton, uh, Amanda Nichols, uh, myself, and then Joe Witt uh, uh, will be responding. So uh, I'm gonna present an old fashioned paper and then I think my, uh, my colleagues have slides. So my paper is Animal, Vegetable, or Mineral? Political Ontologies of Fossil Fuel Extractivism. In this paper, I ask, what are fossil fuels? I examine and compare different discourses about the materiality of fossil fuels, drawing on theoretical literatures to articulate their relationship to human being and to situate them within the political ecologies that we inhabit. Although fossil fuels are composed of the remains of living things from many millions of years ago, they are not, technically speaking, fossilized. It is true that coal, oil, and gas are made from organic matter, the remains of plants and animals, mostly from the Devonian period, and it is true that this matter has been transformed by geologic processes, but fossilization generally refers to the mineralization processes that allow scientists to analyze the morphology of ancient plants and animals. Fossil fuels are thus an ambiguous category, not properly fossils, but distinct from other minerals because these types of biologically derived hydrocarbons retain solar energy chemically stored through bio biological accumulation like photosynthesis and predation from eons ago. So what then are fossil fuels? Ontologically, how can we think about and talk about what kind of being they are? This paper considers various discourses about fossil fuels and draws on contemporary social science and humanities scholarship to theorize about possible relationships between human beings and fossil fuels. Different discourses about fossil fuels stem from distinct political imaginaries and chart divergent discourses uh, about uh, fossil fuels that foreground their origination in, a li in living things and facilitate prophetic warnings against the dangers of extractivism and climate catastrophe. Contrastingly, discourses that obscure, uh, wait, I'm sorry, uh, let me back up. My underlying argument is meant to be anti-ironic. Discourses about fossil fuels that foreground their origination from living things facilitate prophetic warnings about the dangers of extractivism and climate catastrophe. Contrastingly, discourses that obscure the fact that ancient life is the material basis of fossil fuels or that emphasize the deadness of matter foster fatalism about mass extinction and justify economic extractivism. Fossil fuels are, uh, ubiquitous, uh, are ubiquitous in modern life, both directly in terms of the extensive infrastructures required to ensure that gasoline is everywhere easily accessible and indirectly through the myriad forms of energy use that flow from their combustion. This ubiquity remained for much of the 20th century an intellectually marginal consideration, bubbling to the surface of academic attention only occasionally. But over the past decade, a proliferation of humanistic scholarship on fossil fuels, sometimes called petroculture studies or energy humanities, has labored to address the interplay among socio-political systems, cultural production, and fossil fuels. One of the key questions scholars in this area have discussed is how and why have the social and cultural ramifications of our material dependence on fossil fuels so long eluded critical scrutiny? Given the ubiquity and centrality of coal, oil, and gas in the macro-historical trends of the 20th century, uh, why are the energy humanities only newly, relatively newly emergent? One answer to this question, offered on different terms by different scholars, is that fossil fuels, oil in particular, are slippery. Fossil fuels evade our intellectual grasp in part because the petro infrastructures, uh, because petro infrastructures are purposely situated along the margins of society, 
and in part because they move through the machinery of our everyday lives with a kind of mercurial impermanence, transforming from liquids into solids and, into, and then greenhouse gases with an invisible atmospheric ease. To ask what are fossil fuels follows from these observations. I inquire more specifically about the elusive substantiality of fossil fuels, particularly petroleum. My aim is to place the conversation uh, place in conversation scholarship on fossil fuels, scholarship on the ontology of non-living beings like land or waters, and the particular and the particular corner of environmental humanities that is uh, animated by religious studies. <coughs> Uh, I want to compare three distinct political ontologies of fossil fuels, analyzing the different imaginaries about what they are and how they became available for human use. I use this category of political ontologies because it helps, uh, because uh, it elucidates the way that fossil fuels are connected uh, uh, and articulated through divergent forms of resource extraction. How the matter of fossil fuels is conceptualized matters for the kinds of politics that circulate through our energy systems. So this is part of a longer paper, and for the purposes of the presentation, I'm really going to focus on the first political ontology and then say a little bit about the second two. So fossil fuels have been described by the US Department of Energy uh, as, quote, molecules of freedom, uh, end quote, uh, by settler scholars as, quote, fossilized death, end quote, and by indigenous theorists uh, as weaponized kin. I take these as uh, articulations as representative of three distinct discursive formations that we can playfully call, as in a game of many questions, the animal, the vegetable, and the mineral. So let's talk first about a mineral ontology, molecules of freedom. Uh, in this discursive formation, uh, fossil fuels are dissociated from biological matter. Attempts by the US Energy, uh, Department of Energy during the Trump administration under the leadership of then Secretary Rick Perry uh, to rebrand fossil fuels as molecules of freedom and to rename uh, natural gas as freedom gas were met by the mainstream media with an incredulity and somewhat cynical humor. Uh, true, associating particular kinds of hydrocarbon molecule, molecular chains with the provincially American notions of freedom have a same greasy absurdity as did the post 9-11 reactionary renaming of French fries as freedom fries. But this rhetorical maneuver should be seen in context of deeper conceptual, ideological, and theological movements uh, that gave it significance. The discourse about, quote, molecules of freedom unambiguously serves the interests of fossil fuel uh, corporations. Perry was a board member for Energy Transfer Partners, the company behind the Dakota Access Pipeline, both immediately before and immediately following his stint at the Department of Energy. Uh, and the US government has a stake in promoting US-based companies that extract, process, and export fossil fuel-based energy and products. The language of molecules of freedom and freedom gas communicates two important aspects of US energy policy. First, it advances the claim that energy derived from US-based fossil fuel extractive projects is more closely aligned with freedom and po the political liberalism espoused by US policymakers. This implies, of course, that energy from the US can be distinguished from the fossil fuel-based energy uh, sources of, quote, unfree nations, like, uh, and this would be uh, in the way that this is framed in, in US government uh, documents, Saudi Arabia, Russia, or Venezuela. Other democratic oil and gas producing nations, notably Norway, also promote their fossil fuel exports with a similar kind of uh, logic. So a second uh, power of this kind of discourse is to, uh, on uh, an emphasis on freedom gas is a Trump administration re reworking of an Obama administration era emissions reduction policy that relies on the relatively lower levels of greenhouse gas emissions that come from electricity generation by natural gas as opposed to coal. Uh, although the Trump administration formally withdrew the U.S. from the United Nations Paris Agreement, attempts to promote fossil fuels as freedom gas uh, endured as a kind of disingenuous transition discourse, facilitating the expansion of fossil fuel extraction and pipeline projects to help sell natural gas as a bridge uh, fuel for, um, towards emissions reductions, doing so in terms friendly to the fossil fuel industry. The policy orientation of mo the molecules of freedom discourse is readily legible, but beneath the political superficiality are resonances with the constellation of theologies, ideologies, and conspiracy theories. Replacing the term fossil with freedom obfuscates the biotic nature, uh, uh, 
the biotic basis of fossil fuels and emphasizes the availability of oil and gas for use. This discourse redefines these materials at the molecular level, locating their meaning in terms of their utility as guarantors of liberal modernity and the promise of freedom. Where natural gas comes to be through geologic processes, freedom gas comes to be through production and consumption. The former is a geologic framing, the latter a political one. Removing the term fossil is also a rhetorical move that appeals to young earth creationists, climate denialists, and conspiracy theorists who assert the abiotic origin of petroleum. At least since the mid 17th century, when Bishop Usher dated the, uh, the creation of the world to October, specifically the 22nd of October, uh, 4004 BC, uh, fossil, fossils generally have been a source of consternation among Christian thinkers who seek empirical confirmation for a literalist interpretation of the Genesis account. Paleontology provides theolog or provokes theological anxieties because it so clearly poses questions about the relationship of human beings to the inception of life as such. In Euro-American Christian history, there is a long record of iconoclastic claims that fossilized plant and animal remains are evidence of life forms that perished in the Great Deluge, the Noahic Flood. These claims, while still easy to find in Christian homeschooling curricula and online wing nuttery, uh, no longer carry the kind of expository power they may once have had before the advent of radiocarbon dating and other sophisticated paleontological methods. But have I, I as, have I as, as I have already argued, fossil fuels are not exactly fossilized. Because fossil fuels are not the preserved remains of ancient life forms, young earth creationists continue to insist that they are intelligible within the frame of biblical literalism. Within the intractable dynamics of the American culture wars, fossil fuels remain ontologically disputed. There are multiple theories about the origination of fossil fuels that are compatible with young earth creationism. But these theories necessarily begin with a premise that oil, gas, and coal are providential gifts deposited by a benevolent creator god and, uh, uh, and deposited beneath the earth uh, for, uh, so that in the fullness of history, human beings would, be, would progress sufficiently to make proper use of that gift. The compatibility of the molecules of freedom discourse with the providentialist theology of young earth creationism is straightforward. Biogeological considerations of deep time are moved to the periphery so that the defining characteristic of fossil fuels becomes their availability for human use, specifically human use within a world order sanctioned by covenantal endorsement. There are many pseudoscientific sources, including uh, natural history journals that lack peer review processes and creation science institutes that describe petrogenesis, a theory that dates oil and gas deposits to the worldwide flood of about 2500 BC. As one uh, uh, creationist website puts it, you do not have to believe that the earth is billions of years old to find oil. <clears throat> Young earth creationism is not the only source of ontological doubt about fossil fuels. There are conspiracy theorists who claim that petroleum is abiotic in origin, that it is produced by ongoing geological processes and is in fact a renewable resource. Abiogenic theories of petroleum have been around for hundreds of years, but these heretical ideas were repopularized in the 1980s by Thomas Gold. There are various alternative explanations uh, of the origin of fossil fuels that converge around a set of conspiratorial claims that the biogenic account of oil is a way to fake scarcity and to price a renewable resource as a fixed commodity. Uh, this uh, is less widely held than other conspiracy theories that you may be familiar with, but at least this conspiracy theory had some traction in Trump's inner circle with Jerome Corsi of WikiLeaks fame, uh, having wrote, uh, uh, written a book specifically about the abiotic uh, uh, origins of oil. So during his tenure as Secretary of the Department of Energy, Perry regularly cast doubt on the scientific veracity of global warming. For example, saying in 2017 that carbon dioxide was not the primary driver of atmospheric warming. Previously, as governor of Texas and as a Republican candidate for the presidency, Perry advanced policies that encouraged the teaching of creationism in public schools. This is not to say that the, quote, molecules of freedom uh, branding campaign was at Perry's personal behest, nor that his rhetoric was specifically intended to advance climate denialism, conspiracy theory, or creation science. However, the attempt to change the terminology of the public discourse about fossil fuels, obfuscating the bio biotic nature of fossil fuels, was symbolically uh, powerful to creationist conspiracy theory and climate denialist constituencies. This discourse empowers, emboldens, and legitimates the policy ambitions of these groups. 
the molecules of freedom discourse, this, what I'm calling this mineral ontology, uh, posits fossil fuels as non-living matter. This resonates with theological ontologies in which not only is matter divinely created, but also which, uh, in which matter is meaningful primarily only in and through its usefulness to human beings. This mineral ontology accepts only God and humans as agents and offers a political theology of techno-capitalist triumphalism about the moral righteousness of releasing energy stored at the molecular level. So let me talk about the other two ontologies uh, a little bit more briefly. So this second ontology uh, I'm calling uh, the vegetal is a kind of ecological gothic. It explicitly recognizes that fossil fuels are made of, the decompo of decomposed plants and animals and foregrounds their deadness and strikes a macabre tone in order to warn about the dangers of the climate crisis. This discourse, uh, which we're all probably familiar with, is common throughout the environmental humanities and among climate activists as well. For example, a in a 2013 essay, Botskis and Pendakis explicitly link petroleum's invisibility, which I was discussing above, with its inherent plasticity, its ability to take any shape and become many things, and argues that this kind of infinite malleability is associated with an existence outside of time that is death. Oil, in this ontology, is a liquefied purgatory for diatoms and ancient, other ancient microscopic creatures, the and the combustion of fossil fuels is seen as a kind of necromancy that bestirs the many billions of individual deaths and, ha and haunts our atmosphere with revivified suffering. For example, the Solarities collection, uh, Collective of Environmental Humanists and Energy Scholars uh, make the same kind of discursive move, writing that solar energy stands over and above the dead body of fossil fuels. This juxtaposition emphasizes not only that fossil fuels are composed of dead bodies, but it is quite clear that as a source of energy, their global industrial youth is quite literally the cause of mass death. In this sense, the discourse about fossilized death is intentionally prophetic full of righteous anger and warning about the suffering that follows from the burning, uh, the burning of death itself to keep warm. Acknowledging that petroleum is composed of the rotten catalyzed bodies of myriad creatures, this political ontology accepts that the modern consumerist culture, uh, or that modern consumerist culture exists in and through the death of other living things and further characterizes the forms of flourishing that emerge uh, from the combustion of fossil fuels as perpetually shattered by death and corpusculence. Unlike the molecules of freedom discourse, this ontology categorically insists on the biological origins of fossil fuels, but the particular aspect of biology that it underscores is death. Death is a powerful way to speak about absolute limits, about the immediate necessity of ending the global dependence on fossil fuels for energy, transportation, agriculture, and materials. But this rhetoric of death so central to the uh, but the rhetoric of death is so central to this vegetal ontology is limited in its profund the, by the profundity of its eschatology. That is, what comes after mass death? How might a political ontology of fossil fuels imagine a sustainable future replete with the forms of restorative justice and mutuality that must be part of our life on earth after petroleum? So I would like to move to the third uh, ontology uh, and here the, the sort of the conclusion, and it, it, it's a bit abrupt, so the argument is still getting uh, fleshed out, as it were. So the third uh, political ontology, which I'm calling the animal, is connected to Zoe Todd's description of uh, fossil fuels as uh, fossil kin. Uh, this also uh, emphasizes and overlaps with uh, the biological and uh, death of living creatures discourse that I was framing uh, earlier uh, in terms of fossilized death. But uh, Todd's characterization of fossilized uh, fossil fuels as weaponized kin is an assertion that, quote, reframes fossilized beings uh, extracted from indigenous homelands as fossilized kin in lieu of their uh, current colonial framing and non-renewable resources as fossil fuels. As a discursive intervention, this is an explicit effort to forge a political ontology grounded in indigenous sovereignty and epistemology, and this reframing accomplishes at least two things. First, it focuses on the lives of these biologically derived hydrocarbon energies, um, and second, it refutes the underlying logic of extractivism, objecting to the reductive ontology of resource extraction that follows from the naming of uh, fuels. Fossil kin are not something that exists merely to be burned. Their being is grounded primarily in their relationship to other living things, like people, land, waters, animals. 
foregoing questions of use in favor of questions of relationships radically changes the possibility as to how humans can or should relate to fossilized ancient life. As kin, progenitors of contemporary life on Earth as such, hydrocarbons are not to be ignored, refused, or abused. Fossil fuels are animated, dynamic beings that exist alongside us in time and space. Proper relations with them are possible, harmful relations are as well. Getting the relationships right matters because matter is never permanently dead, only always in flux. Thank you. and you get in front of this thing, you just fail. Like, I think there's a curse. Uh, it's like being in front of my students. I just, you'd think I know how to use a computer. I clearly do not. Thanks, Amanda. You're welcome. Are we up there? Oh, give you us help. We're gonna have to get the projector back on. Well, we don't need it on. We do. Can you work with that one? With uh, sorry? Oh yeah, this is fine. You see it here. Okay, as long as no one else sees this. Okay. Well, I'll be. Oh great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Evan. That was great. I'm so excited to see this work evolve, and I think it's going to be so helpful to kind of. I'm so glad you went first because <laughs> now I'm going to talk about kind of this question in a more. I mean, grounded in my ethnography, so it's more grounded in place and people, specific places and specific people. Um, but also, uh, thank you so much for my co-panelists and for Evan for convening us and Amanda for your thoughts and Joe for your thoughts that are about to come. I think this is so exciting. Um, this paper has given me an opportunity. Oh, I'll take this off now. Uh, this paper ha has given me the opportunity to combine a few moments from my current book project uh, in a way that I haven't had the chance to before. So I'm going to step back slightly from my ethnographic proximity and articulate a broader theme that I think is relevant for the place I study, but I hope will be relevant for our conversation more broadly and possibly your work. So I'm really excited to hear your thoughts and reflections. Um, so yes, all right. When the city of Calgary declared a climate emergency in 2021, the mood in the room was optimistic. After hosting energy company leaders for breakfast, Mayor Jody Gondek and council voted to make this declaration in hopes of clarifying Calgary's energy policy on energy transition and inviting investment. As Calgary is the corporate center of Canada's oil economy, mediating and managing Alberta's massive oil reserves, such a de declaration was meant differently than it might in a different place. For Mayor Gondek, this declaration was consistent with Calgary's context, explaining that this was the direction energy companies were already headed, and this move was essential for continuing to grow the relationship between Calgary and the energy sector. The Calgary Herald reported local leaders as being enthusiastic about this declaration. The Calgary Chamber of Commerce President Deborah Yedlin said that Calgary had the opportunity to become the Silicon Valley of energy transition technologies. And Kevin Crossart, CEO of a company called Avatar Innovations, said, quote, the energy transition is the single greatest economic opportunity facing Calgary, unquote. This event mirrored similar efforts by local groups to mobilize civic values toward a diversified energy economy. Groups like the Energy Futures Lab work to, as they say, quote, leverage Canada's assets and innovation to accelerate an inclusive and equitable transition to a prosperous net zero future, unquote. While initiatives like the Energy Disruptors Summit prompt participants to be energy trailblazers with the question, quote, the energy for change is in all of us. Do you have the audacity to take the path of most resistance, unquote. The, Chal the Calgary Chamber of Commerce pro uh, prioritizes energy transition and promote ways to, as their website says, energize the future. In their focus on trailblazing, leveraging, and general prospecting for riches with this new energized future, these assertions reinscribe Alberta's already existing energy epistemology rather than reforming it. In addition to asserting Calgary's ongoing identity as an energy center, 
This former energy epistemology is one shaped by oil, and these oil values threaten to continue to shape human relationships to land and each other, even within new energy technologies in this context. Today, I want to think through how an industrial religion of oil has shaped a civil religion of energy in Calgary, which articulates certain kinds of energy citizenship and energy piety. The problem I want to solve, maybe, <laughs> maybe not today, but generally by theorizing this oily energy epistemology as a civil religion grounded in an industrial one, is to move away from the implications of theorizing this as a confessional or personal religion, necessarily, um, or maybe not the only that. Through a relationship between land and people convened by extraction, um, oh, I wanted to show you this. Here's the Energy Trailblazers logo. Um, through a relationship between land and people convened by an extraction, a story of energy is created, and in theor theorizing qualities of work, play, and community is either bringing people closer to or further from alignment with this energy, people in Calgary are world-making in a religious ways that take particular forms in the public sphere, in the civic realm. So, first, what does this look like? Let's talk about it a bit. Um, some of you might have heard this before, so please, this is some, my, some of my favorite case studies, so <laughs> bear with me, I appreciate your patience. Um, one of the ways, one of the most prominent evocations of energy in the city of Calgary is the slogan for the city itself, be part of the energy. The municipal group Calgary Economic Development introduced this slogan in 2015, replacing this earlier city slogan of Calgary, heart of the new west. This call to be part of the energy is ubiquitous in Calgary. It is displayed on tourist flyers, on posters sponsoring local arts and community events, and local economic development brochures, of course. This slogan is intentionally referring to both the oil and gas, so energy industry, and evoking a community energy, and kind of conflating them as the same thing. But when I spoke to a representative from Calgary Economic Development asking if the community energy existed because of the other energy, the other energy industry, they pushed back saying, quote, yeah, but I would say it goes back even farther than that. If you look at our history, it's always been a place where people, any person that comes here who wants to do something, as long as they're hardworking, they can do it, unquote. This theorizing is at the heart of be part of the energy, that there is an overarching energy and oil is simply just one iteration of it. Despite this, in our interview, they reflected on how they have, at times, felt under siege about the word energy in light of environmental concerns. They said, quote, a lot of people said you need to drop the campaign. And I was like, why would we abandon our key industry and demand for energy overall? First of all, it doesn't say be part of oil and gas. It says be part of the energy. And we are blessed with an abundance of hydro hydrocarbons in this province that are underfoot, about which mo mo most of the decisions are made in Calgary. We are blessed with an abundance of wind because of our Rocky Mountains, and we are blessed with an abundance of sun. So this is an energy center, and it will always be an energy center." Unquote. In this theorizing, be part of the energy is less of an invitation than it is an enlistment. The energy has its own logics and powers that can allow a person to thrive if they engage in it in some right way. Being part of the energy also takes on this enlisting quality in the case of Canada's Energy Citizens Campaign by the CAP by CAP, which is the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, the lobby group that represents oil and gas producers in, all, in Canada. While this, ca while this is a Canada-wide initiative, the presence is particularly felt in Calgary through their lobby work uh, politically, but also their public relations work, which take on particularly Calgarian flavors. Seated at a table in a popular downtown pedestrian mall during the Calgary Stampede, which is a fair and rodeo, which is also a very important area for oil work. I read about it elsewhere, but you can ask me later if you want. Um, representation, uh, representatives from this organization spoke with passers-by about the importance of his supporting the industry while handing out fistfuls of swag, including this uh, Canada Energy Citizens Sheriff's Badge, uh, which is obviously a, a Western reference. Um, being an energy citizen in this context explicitly means being pro-oil, but specifically means signing up for a listserv <laughs> that encourage you to write letters to your member of parliament or vote in, sp in certain ways. Despite the limited nature of the campaign itself, the title of Energy Citizens has legs, even just in the form of pins and posters around the city. These two things, be part of the energy or being an energy citizen, put words to what other experiences speak to more generally, particularly the Calgarian experience of feeling like the work culture of oil extraction is also the local culture generally. It dictates the terms of success and failure, risk and reward, virtue and weakness. 
One person I spoke to, who I gave the name Barry, a financier for oil work I met at the Global Petroleum Show, and this is a picture of the welcome banner at the Global Petroleum Show, um, uh, gave me some insight into what it was like to live uh, these kind, uh, these live within the world these corporate slogans craft. In describing Calgary and its culture, he articulated a kind of energy that required certain virtues of a person, particularly a work hard, play hard mentality and a community mindedness. He was enthusiastic about the good life available in Calgary and its, and its accessibility to someone who wants to work doggedly and is willing to have a beer with their colleagues. In the world he and others described to me, to be part of the energy, one must navigate the world with a casualness, commitment to relationality, and interest in play. One must have the hardiness and self-motivation to endure hard work and sacrifice, and one must have access to success through a kind of fortune, luck, or fate that is channeled within this energy. Through uh, these values, being part of the energy is a condition of constant striving, an endeavor that weaves the work of oil extraction and the good life together in the personal values and habits of Calgarians. For Barry, on the financial side, he has seen incredible successes and losses. Oil can give and it can take away on the basis of a combination of fate and character. At the end of our conversation, though, he reflected that despite his love for his work, he might steer his own kids away from it because, quote, I've seen a lot of people get hurt by the booms and busts, and I think we all know there's a defined life to it. So I'd be like, it's a great place here, stay, but really insulate yourself against the energy, end quote. Thinking with these brief examples, I have some questions. What is this energy then? Is it something that you can insulate yourself from or possibly not? Can you be part of it? Are you a citizen of it? This theorizing seems constant in Calgary with stakes at multiple different registers, corporate interests, political rhetoric, personal positive thinking type talk. But despite its universalizing tendencies, the gloss of the word energy, the force being theorized here is one shaped by oil extraction. It's an industri as, an un as an industrial undertaking with the materiality of this industry, its products and conditions shaping the reasoning and allegories of the theology of energy. The industrial is not peripheral in Alberta, but central, shaping the province as it is now and mapping the relationships that exist between the government, corporations, indigenous communities, settlers, and temporary workers, as this mural uh, kind of illustrates, even though I'm not going to talk about that here. I talk about it lots of other ways other places. Um, this centrality manifests in the province as what Calhoun, Lofton, and Seals has called an industrial religion. In this case, an industrial religion of oil. As in the examples they trace, oil companies and other forces in Alberta worked alongside Protestant trends, as these authors say, to quote, mutually constit constituting an orientation to modern life that promotes industrial technologies as ha and habits as rightly religious, end quote. Oil, like coal in Callahan's description here, is at once substance and symbol, quote, congealing multiple meanings of progress into one enchanted material, end quote. Contemporary theorizing about energy in Calgary is grounded in the materialism of oil industrialism in ways that shape the allegories of people, the, the allegories that people use to imagine the energy um, that the city slogan invites you to be a part of, or for you to be a citizen of, or that shapes your access to the good life as a worker. But what are the mechanisms then that enable this industrial religion of oil and its allegories to be practiced and communicated in this place? To think about this, I turn to the notion of civil religion. Um, I think happily, maybe hesitantly, I don't know. Um, civil religion, of course, the concept articulated by, by Robert Bella to describe the American rituals of national identity, or as Catherine Albanese describes in our scripture, American religions and religion, um, quote, religious nationalism as institutionalized in a loose religious system. This has been taken up in lots of different ways globally. One way the term has been taken up relevant to our discussion here is Darren Dochuk's notion of a uh, civil religion of crude. Dochuk contrasts the civil religion of crude with what he calls wildcat or Christianity, the former aligned with the bureaucratic outlook of the Rockefellers and the later with the discovery drilling of companies like Union Oil and Sun Oil. What these groups shared was a belief in the providence of petroleum, the mixing of sacred and material goals of oil extraction, and how this is realized within Americans' own identity and mythos. This maybe has different questions in Canada that I'm not going to get into, both civil religion and uh, Dochuk's kind of uh, binary here. Um, but while I think the current Albertan context has many affinities with, thinking, with the thinking of wild powder Christianity, especially the theorizing of subterranean mysteries and a theology of communing with the land, 
uh, Dotuk's configuration of the civil religion of crude allows me to understand the placemaking um, power of the examples I've spoken about today. The practitioners of a civil religion of crude work to, quote, apply oil's gifts to the construction of a godly society, unquote. I'm thinking of what you just said, Evan, here. Um, and quote, oil's global topographies became their theological planes on and through they, would in, they could envision human accord, unquote. Those hoping to energize the future, those energy trailblazers I started my talk with today, are oriented in their confidence about the work of energy transition because of their energy citizenship or the ability they feel to have shown to be part of the energy in Calgary. And these are just some examples of public religion, public, I would say, civil religion in Calgary on the slide there. And here are some pictures of Calgary um, immersed in wildfire smoke while I was there in 2018. So as my examples suggest, when corporations or government agencies or lobby groups have articulated their ideas about Calgary or Calgarians, they imagine them as uniquely equipped to bring in a new industrial modernity with different in, uh, energy sources for fuel because of its oil culture, not despite it. Through public storytelling, initiatives like Be Part of the Energy or Canada's Energy Citizens I described, and the colloquial theorizing about how to do this, um, to be this, that my art interlocutor articulated, an industrial religion of oil becomes a civil religion of energy. In this theorizing, this civil religion of energy places oil in a teleology of energy shaped by pro ideas of progress that cu culminates in a modern life in which personal work and morality is entwined in relationships with industrial technologies. The people who live and work in Calgary, this body politic, I suppose, can be seen to understand itself and its identity through this civil religion. But I also see it as meaning making about the place itself. To repeat the Calgary Economic Development um, representative, this is an energy center and it will always be an energy center. In the face of climate emergencies, this is a civil religion of energy oriented by oil in Alberta that describes itself as destined to address it. But with this religion's grounding in the industrial religion of oil, can it? Uh, these Calgarian powers are reinscribing the givenness of energy as oil constitutes it, as opposed to taking this moment of disjuncture to reimagine energy. I say this not to condemn their lack of revolution, but to speak to the power of this civil religion and the way it is mapped onto the space. Kara Daggett, in her book, The Birth of, uh, the Birth of Energy, stresses the need to parochialize energy um, epistemologies, which I think, Evan, you're doing really well in your paper as well. And Calgary's energy epistemology is indeed parochial, occupying a space that already has likely many other energy epistemologies. Evan brought up Métis scholar Zoe Todd's work, of course, and her work has pointed to this, about this place, these Calgarians, in her descriptions that, like fish or la uh, land, oil is kin for Indigenous people in Alberta, kin that is weaponized by colonial economics to the detriment of the climate broadly. I see a need to recognize the Calgary energy as a specific civil religion. And with this framing, I wonder if what is required to possibly shift the energy epistemology is a kind of cosmic diplomacy. This is the term um, Edward Cohn recently wrote about um, in a piece called Anthropology as Cosmic Diplomacy. As cosmic diplomats, we might be able to engage with this specific civil religion of energy and bring it into conversation with other cosmologies. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here today, and thank you, Judith and Evan, and thank you, Joe, for being here to respond to us. I'm looking forward to your comments. Perfect. On September 19th, 2022, Isabel Boemka, the self-labeled world's first nuclear energy influencer, took to the TED stage to promote her vision of increasing nuclear power technologies as a means of salvation from a carbon-dependent energy future. Through her futuristic social media personality, Isodope, Boemka aims to shift public perception of nuclear power by spreading her vision of a future where nuclear power is the world's leading source of energy production. Today, after providing you with a brief overview of the ferment over nuclear energy technologies and some background on isodope, 
I will explore some of the religious dimensions of the rhetorical strategy Boemka employs to sell her pro-nuclear message. I will argue that Boemka's vision of a techno-scientific salvation achieved through nuclear energy dependency perpetuates religious ideology ideologies that exacerbate injustices of resource extraction and energy dependence. Moreover, through a close examination of the isodope accounts, we can begin to see how these ideas are mediated and disseminated through popular culture and how they influence the ways that our society imagines and enacts our energy futures. Today, the detrimental effects of carbon-based fuel sources, including and especially their contribution to anthropogenic climate change, has motivated scientists to develop alternative renewable energy solutions. Among those, nuclear power has been one of the most highly contested because of the associated risk to the health and stability of ecological systems. A growing number of scientists argue that a carbon neutral energy future is not feasible without continued development of nuclear power technologies. Anti-nuclear activists, however, argue that the potential associated dangers to the health and stability of ecological systems makes nuclear power an unnecessarily risky response to the global energy crisis. They express numerous concerns, but are especially alert to environmental justice issues and the transgenerational effects of uranium extraction, nuclear waste spills, and radiation incidents for both human and ecosystem health and viability. According to Boemka, her passion for nuclear power was inspired by a 2015 tweet from American planetary scientist Carolyn Porco a world leader in planetary imaging and the team lead for the Cassini imaging mission to Saturn. In the tweet, Porco espoused, let's dump oil and go nuclear. After seeing this tweet, Boemka said, she quote, began to question her own anti-nuclear attitude and went on what she described as a journey to expose the myth that society had been taught about nuclear, that nuclear power is bad. In February 2020, Boemka created the Twitter account for Isodope, which was soon thereafter followed with an Instagram account in March and a TikTok account in June, both bearing different iterations of the same name. As Elliot and Erica Jemez described it in their 2021 article, Isodope is a body-suited, fission-charged deity whose sole purpose is to hack the social media algorithm and introduce an unsuspecting audience to one of the most important messages of our generation. On her website, Boemka explained the reasoning behind the AI-inspired futuristic isodope persona. Climate communication often gets washed out, she said. The otherworldly persona gets people to pay attention. And people are paying attention. Her social media have been growing steadily, and she now has almost 39,000 followers on TikTok alone. Moreover, in addition to her TED Talk, Boemka has recently been featured in numerous magazines and interviews, including in Time and in an interview with well-known film director Oliver Stone, who has also been outspoken recently about his pro-nuclear environmental perspectives. Boemka's goal, as she puts it, is to, quote, change public opinion to help solve the climate crisis, a mission, she believes, that can be accomplished by decarbonizing our energy emissions through increased nuclear energy dependency. Society has been blinded by a meme, Boemka said, that because nuclear weapons are bad, nuclear power must be bad too. In her TED Talk, Boemka defined the word meme as a fixed belief or idea, good or bad, that spreads from person to person and defines how we see the world. Meme here is a reference to what evolutionary, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins first identified and defined in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, as a, quote, unit of cultural information spread by imitation. For Dawkins, memes carry information are replicated and are transmitted from one person to another, and they have the ability to evolve, mutating at random and undergoing natural selection. Through social media, Boemka hopes to spread a new meme about nuclear. This is important because as Sarah McFarland Taylor uh, has shown, mediated popular culture has immense rhetorical power 
and it's at work in our everyday lives morally affirming or discouraging our beliefs and behaviors. Moreover, if we take David Chittister seriously, that the production, circulation, and consumption of popular culture can operate like religion in society, then Boemka's meme might be understood as an attempt to promote religious-like following around a pro-nuclear agenda. So on a very basic level, Boemka's rhetoric works to disrupt the meme that nuclear power is bad by establishing a clear dichotomy whereby nuclear is replaced with something even worse and by comparison becomes good and sometimes even cool for her. Her language creates a sacred profane dichotomy used to market what she portrays as a very uncomplicated message. Uh, nuclear is good, fossil fuels are bad. References to fossil fuels as dirty, dangerous, bad, and terrible for the environment are ubiquitous across Boemka's accounts. This language is often paired with apocalyptic and anthropocentric messaging and imagery about the end of the planet or the demise of the human species. On the other hand, Boemka relies on the trope, nuclear energy is clean energy, and regularly gives us the pros of nuclear in her post and beseeches us to think about a brighter, better nuclear-powered future. These messages are often paired with green fields and bright blue skies, AI-inspired or futuristic spacescapes, or cutesy dolphins, rainbows, and unicorns that look like they might have come from a 1990s Lisa Frank sticker book. Beyond that, though, there is another level of the sacred versus profane marketing strategy that Boemka uses that takes full advantage of the post-truth society in which we live. The deeper social messaging here is that society has been lied to, or as Boemka puts it, sold a bad meme. Many of her posts focus on debunking the myths of nuclear, illuminating the quote misinformation and helping her viewers to realize that their reservations about nuclear power are grounded in strategically employed quote fear mongering. She critiques this misinformation as never being based in science as an authoritative source of capital T truth, a notion that our keynote speaker here, Mary Jane Rubenstein, eloquently critiqued in her 2022 book, Astrotopia. So going one step further, however, Boemka's narrative about the emergence of the nuclear power is bad meme is no more than a half truth. Her one-sided portrayal of the global nuclear debate not only mythologizes the pros of nuclear, but it minimizes the fraught history of the anti-nuclear movement, and it shrouds the complex history of the development of nuclear technologies from inception. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. The nuclear power is bad meme, Boemka claimed, was born out of the anti-nuclear movement of the 1970s and 80s, and was spread as a social critique of the nuclear arms race during the Cold War. This meme has permeated our societal perception of nuclear power, she asserts, and prevented us from realizing its full potential. This history is important when we think about broader social discourses about nuclear power and the ways that Boemka through Isodope markets her pro-nuclear agenda. The hyper-futuristic persona um, and futures motivated language might lead the uninformed social media user, which is in fact Boemka's target audience, to believe that the pro-nuclear power stance is a novel conception and that nuclear power is the salvation we have all been waiting for to help mitigate the impending climate crisis. Take for instance, these examples, which link nuclear energy to space exploration, supercars, and the future not being a complete disaster. Consider too the language of salvation she used in her TED talk when she countered what she called the most fashionable argument against nuclear power, that energy, nuclear energy is too expensive, uh, with the sarcastic quip, quote, it's a little weird to say something is too expensive to save the future of our species. One of the main problems with Boemka's message is that it's, not a, that it's not new. In fact, her rhetoric is strikingly reminiscent of the pro-nuclear discourse used in the 1940s and 50s to promote the Manhattan Project and to sell the promise of nuclear technology as what Jeremy Gunn called the spiritual weapon to attack atheistic communism. 
In fact, the salvific potential of nuclear technologies has been a long-standing trope in pro-nuclear political rhetoric and has been used to justify the development and expansion of America's nuclear program. Boemke's use of the, uh, the term nuclear as salvific rhetoric then becomes nothing more than a mutation of the much older pro-nuclear meme. Boemka also uses pop culture references that are recognizable to her audience to support her claims and mythologize nuclear as an unproblematic solution to our energy woes. In her TED Talk, for instance, she pointed out that the Simpsons brought an anti-nuclear message into American homes every evening through Homer Simpson's laissez-faire and careless attitude toward his job as safety inspector at Springfield Nuclear Power Plant. But here again, Boemka's version of the story is only a half-truth. The rhetoric and imaging that she uses on social media mimics that used to promote nuclear power in the 1950s and 60s. Like her isodope accounts, this earlier marketing also relied on a hyper-futuristic vision of nuclear technologies. Historian John Wills wrote, for instance, that people did not need to, quote, understand the actual science of the atom to buy into the pro-nuclear myth. If nuclear power was packaged as a sleek and attractive electrical good, like a nuclear-powered toaster, then they, people would welcome the atom into their homes. And before there was the anti-nuclear messaging in The Simpsons, the Jetsons gave us technological optimism in the 1960s, which was driven by the success of the Manhattan Project and fueled by the dream of harnessing that power to go to space. Now, through the futuristic bodysuit wearing AI deity Isodope, we get the promise of unlimited energy potential that will drive the future and that perpetuates a long held vision of the human as an interplanetary creature. The problem here is that Boemka's vision of a nuclear dependent future promotes a meme that exacerbates injustices of resource extraction and energy dependence. Two specific but brief examples will help to elucidate this point. First, Boemka likes to talk about how the nuclear industry is the only energy industry, quote, responsible for its own waste. While it is certainly true that in the US, the EPA mandates that nuclear corporations have a plan for short-term storage of radioactive nuclear waste, there is no extant plan, either at the level of the corporation or the US federal government, for the long-term storage of radioactive nuclear waste in this country. Despite renewed attempts by the Trump administration to fund research and continue development at Yucca Mountain, the proposed geological repository site in, Nova in Nevada, no federal funding has been allocated to that project since 1992. Another issue with this claim is that Boemka fails to consider where exactly that waste does go for short-term or interim storage. In the US, Nuclear waste has been disproportionately relegated to native tribal lands, exacerbating issues of social and environmental injustice, and perpetuating the legacy of colonialism in the U.S. In the 1990s, for instance, the U.S. government made an effort to open monitored retrievable storage sites for the interim storage of high-level nuclear waste. Um, as one of my interlocutors told me, when no states wanted to get involved with this, the government offered bribe-level money to tribes in an attempt to get them to take the waste instead. Another common trope that Boemka likes to advance is that nuclear power can help us to end energy poverty and energy inequality around the world. The problem is that the utopian vision of a hypothetical global transition to nuclear does not consider how it will actually be enacted or the infrastructure that has to be in place in order to achieve it. Political theorist Daryl Mullendorf, for example, has spoken to the complications of implementing a broad scale nuclear power infrastructure onto extant power grids, especially in developing countries. In actuality, the transition would be a decades-long process whereby developed nations would be able to transition faster and cheaper than other nations, thus exacerbating energy inequality around the globe. It also does not take into consideration who will bear the brunt of the responsibility or the cost, whether they be fiscal, physical, or environmental, of uranium extraction, the necessary exploitative industry behind nuclear power production. 
So though there are many examples that I could show you, I will conclude with this today. BOEMCA's pro-nuclear messaging presented through Isodope helps us to visualize how the religious rhetoric of extractive energy industries is spread through popular culture. Social media has made disseminating memes an increasingly easy task. Moreover, it has made information about our extractive industries and potential energy futures uh, increasingly accessible to a broad audience and is driving a new wave of pro-nuclear energy politics among the general public in the U.S. And though it may be true that nuclear power use uh, uh, or nuclear power is necessary to hit net zero, it is also true that increasing nuclear power use will exacerbate issues of social and environmental injustice around the world and drive a future of growing dependence on energy uh, extractive energy solutions. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Um, thanks to these panelists. Thanks to everybody who's uh, put in so much work to organize this conference to, to have us all here on this uh, beautiful Saturday morning. I uh, really appreciate it. Really grateful to be here to see uh, people again. So um, really, I just, this um, panel really inspires a lot of thoughts and questions um, that I hope um, we can talk about as, as panelists, but then also as you know, a community of practice of everybody who's uh, gathered here today. Um, so I think just listening to these papers and you know, hearing all this excellent research, um, a couple of issues and questions that this raises to me about you know those of us who focus on our, our work on communities impact, impacted by extraction, uh, but then also just kind of theoretical, theoretical and methodological approaches uh, to religion and nature more broadly. So I hope uh, maybe my comments and questions can inspire a little bit more discussion, or if nothing else, at least give you all some more time to think of your own questions. So um, to start, I think one of the things that, um, again, I've found so exciting about this panel uh, is just how it really deals with a lot of methodological and the theoretical issues uh, that I've been wrestling with my own work. And I think that's uh, pretty evident that's conveyed right in the name, religious rhetorics of resource extraction. So as Dr. Berry already noted, uh, some of us perhaps spend a lot of our academic work or academic time outside of religious studies uh, communities. Um, we work with organizations that aren't necessarily focused on religion. Uh, we spend a lot of time you know, trying to advocate why religion matters, why we should pay attention to religion, say in Association of Environmental Studies and Sciences or petrocultures or groups like this. And uh, oftentimes, you know, we're met with this difficulty of trying to explain to these audiences, why does religion matter? It's either the, the assumption that it doesn't, you know, it's irrelevant, or our discipline already does that and we do it better than you, so, you know, what can you religion people add? I don't know if people have had that type of experience. Well, uh, one of the ways that at least historically that I've kind of confronted this challenge uh, is really just to fall back on popular convention and treat religion as some kind of distinct force in human life and society that can be investigated in terms of its relation to other issues. So this gives us the religion and dot, dot, dot approach. Uh, to describing what we do. So religion and ecology, religion and nature, or my own work, uh, religion and mountaintop removal. Um, with this religion and framework, we assert the value of religion by just tacking the term onto other issues. Our work as religion scholars is unique because we deal with this thing called religion and then show how it intersects with other things. Uh, speaking for myself here, maybe I do this because it's easy. Uh, by framing my work to multidisciplinary audiences as religion and, I'm already defining my study as about a discrete thing called religion, and so then I don't have to do too much more to justify why this paper on an environmental issue is also talking about religion for some reason. Uh, it's also the case that many people in the broader public or even other academic audiences aren't really aware of the theoretical discussions within religious studies. Uh, we scholars tend to speak about religion in a way that dramatically differs from the broader public. Uh, so the religion and approach uh, can avoid this problem of translation and never really challenge what audiences think about religion in the first place, uh, except maybe to say that uh, it has surprising connections with nature. Um, but a drawback to this religion and approach, I think, is that uh, it can really perpetuate the sui generis approaches to religion uh, that our more recent uh, scholarship is really thoroughly critiqued. So for example, by using the phrase religion and society, uh, we imply that religion is something distinct from society, uh, but we're still left with the problem of, of identifying just what about religion is different. What is religion and what is not society? Uh, so this approach can also just uh, concede our disciplinary compartmentalization. 
the connections between religions and environments become special sessions at AESS or petrocultures uh, that may attract audiences with current interest in the topic, but it can be hard to convince inter interdisciplinary audiences that religious studies offers useful tools for exploring human nature relations uh, when we're still set apart in our own unique sessions dedicated to religion. So obviously I'm speaking uh, in very broad and simplistic terms here, but I think all that's important to show uh, how, these uh, how these papers uh, really push uh, religion and nature scholarship forward in important ways. So from a religion and approach, this panel might be called religion and extraction or religion and fossil fuels, but that's not what we have here. Uh, instead, our focus here is on rhetorics. Religion is an adjective, not a noun. Uh, rather than examining the interactions of these things out there called religions, we're observing an intentionally curated subset of rhetorics in action, specifically the action of shaping meanings and identities surrounding resource extraction. And these aren't just the meanings of the resources themselves, nuclear or fossil fuels, I have to put that in quotes, uh, thanks to Dr. Berry's uh, paper, uh, but also the collective identities of the societies that are dependent upon them. So rather than trying to describe what religion might have to do with this subject, these papers unapologetically jump right into theorizing and demonstrate how religion theory illuminates often unacknowledged, taken for granted dimensions of modern Western society. So we certainly hear about concepts that can be said to derive from Christian or indigenous or conventionally religious sources, but the primary concerns of these papers focus more on the processes of meaning and identity making. So we have atomic soteriology evangelized through social media. Uh, energy is a kind of Durkheimian sacred uniting a Canadian moral community and the contested ontologies of fossil fuels that lend themselves to different eschatologies. Uh, in these papers, uh, religion is not just some force external to the processes under investigation, but instead, religion names a constellation of activities, to use a phrase I'm taking from an early version of Dr. Berry's paper, uh, conducted by the communities under investigation to justify certain extractive practices and to stifle dissent. Indeed, a common th uh, theme across all these papers is how rhetorics of extraction contribute to nationalist political projects. But as well, religion in these papers doesn't only refer to a subset of rhetorics used by others, but I think that each of these panelists is also aware of how this use of religion also points back to their own efforts at organizing and interpreting these events. By naming and theorizing the lines of discourse surrounding energy and fossil fuels, the scholar has a part to play in these rhetorical strategies as well, and isn't simply a passive observer. So the approach to religion is expansive and theoretically rich and innovative here, uh, but the use of the word extraction, I think, also points to important theoretical and methodological insights that we as a community of practice uh, should consider further. So in the simplest terms, extraction can refer to the process of moving materials from their original locations. But I think the term extraction also conveys a sense of coercion or violence, or at least an ethical imbalance between the parties. So we extract fossil fuels from the ground, uh, but the dentist also extracts a tooth or survivors are extracted from a car wreck. So it's, it's tough to imagine a case where extraction is used for happy situations. Uh, and that ethical relational theme is evident across each of these papers. So Dr. Nichols describes the self-consciously manipulative use of memes by social media influencers, which itself I think is an interesting term, uh, to shape alternative realities surrounding nuclear energy. Dr. Brutton demonstrates how discourse surrounding energy alternatives actually contributes to an Albertan energy civil religion previously shaped by oil. To quote a great line from an early version of the paper, uh, discussions of energy transition actually, quote, reinscribe Alberta's, Alberta's existing energy epistemology rather than reforming it. So Albertans are thus influenced to accept a rebranded status quo as a sign of genuine change. Dr. Berry highlights how the molecules of freedom trope is deployed specifically to mask the process of extraction and the violence that it entails, while conversely, the fossilized death discourse elevates the violence of extraction and the moral culpability of consumers in that violence. In all, these papers don't simply posit a simple dichotomy that some forms of extraction are acceptable while others are not. Instead, they demonstrate that extraction is inevitably a meaning and value-laden uh, relational process, and so is always worthy of continued examination. At the same time, this isn't also just to contribute to a fatalistic view that extraction is inevitable, so we just have to pick our poison. While extraction might point to general, uh, to a, in general to relational process, uh, that doesn't mean that all forms of extraction are therefore morally equivalent. So returning to the theme of the positionality of the scholars, we can also explore how scholarship itself is an extractive process. So in my own region of Appalachia, skepticism of extractive scholarship has existed for a really long time. And so to be able to do any work with uh, their scholars have to go to a really great lengths to explain how their activities can benefit the communities that they study. Simply saying that, the, that the, this research will help us understand something really doesn't cut it. Uh, so this theme of extraction also points back to the need for scholars to be increasingly reflexive about their own position within the issues and the communities that they study. 
So in all, I'm really fascinated by what I think this panel suggests about advancements in religion and nature scholarship, as well as, as the potential for this focus on extraction to illuminate quite a number of ethical considerations for fossil fuels, uh, as well as the scholars who study them. But as we move to the Q&A portion of this panel, I'm also uh, a lot more interested in hearing from the scholars here and all of us assembled in the room about these issues. So some questions, how do we, you see the, this research situating within and advancing religion and nature scholarship? And beyond that, how can this work contribute to environmental humanities and environmental studies projects more broadly? How can we, or even should we, try to distinguish any unique contributions of religious studies to scholarship and the world more broadly? So think about ourselves uh, as scholars. Obviously, how does this relate to us and our work is one place, but we as scholars are really only part of the issue. There are plenty of other people who are involved here too. So I've been talking a lot about environmental humanities and religious studies theorizing, but it also seems to me that one problem with a lot of environmental humanities scholarship is that it can become so overwhelmingly theoretical and obsessed with coining new terms that it seems to detach from material reality. Uh, it can become so speculative and conceptual that it, be it becomes hard to see how it applies to the lived experiences of beings on the planet. Uh, in the hands of some, you know, materiality itself can become an overly abstracted phrase that points only to how we think about the world rather than how we actually engage in it. But Tara Rowe reminds us in her work on critical petrotheologies that oil is a mater material discursive phenomenon. Oil ho holds great symbolic power, but it also refers to a specific substance that has its origins in biogeological processes and has measurable chemical impacts on other organisms. Uh, and Amitav Ghosh uh, notes that it is the uh, very materiality of petroleum that has given it such significance in modern neoliberal society. The very fact that it is a quantifiable and containable substance, unlike sunlight and wind, has made it ideal for capitalist tactics of commodification and control. So I think another important element that I hear across these papers, uh, even as we're discussing rhetorics, is that they refuse to decouple the theory from the material. Each of these papers shows how certain rhetorics of extraction are deliberately shaped to mask the material realities of extraction and its impacts, thus justifying the activities of extractive industries and the politicians who enable them, uh, while also stifling public resistance. Those who seek to promote unjust, destructive, uh, and destructive approaches to extraction want us to forget the material realities of the practice, and so our theorizing shouldn't also contribute to that political goal. Of course, material approaches to religion have been around for a long time, but in the midst of this discussion of research and theory, I think it's important to highlight not just that the world has a material dimension that we should study, but also that underlying under, understanding and naming this materiality is also tied to political and ethical questions, and we scholars are also implicated in that process. So a discussion of extraction and all of its expansive intellectual potential must always come back to the irradiated blood, the contaminated water, or the blackened lungs that are inevitably tied to the practice. And I think Dr. Nichols's paper in particular shows how the bright sci-fi futures promised by clean energy nonetheless create shadow places that we as scholars and also as members of the Earth community shouldn't forget. So this focus on materiality points to the numerous ethical issues involved in extraction, but then recognizing these ethical issues also challenges us as scholars to think how we can contribute in some way to building the worlds we hope to see. On one level, uh, simply naming the ethical assumptions built into certain rhetorical strategies helps us to recognize forces that we might otherwise take for granted. Uh, and as Walter Wink noted, uh, naming the powers is the first step in eventually unmasking and engaging the powers. So naming these rhetorics and their influence becomes a first step in imagining and enacting alternatives. Uh, and this makes me think of the famous quote that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Well, I think it's uh, similar that many economically and socially privileged people in the West have a hard time imagining alternatives here. We can think about alternative sources of energy, uh, but it's hard to imagine a life without at least as much energy as we take uh, for granted today. And so this might be why so many after oil narratives uh, either focus on a Mad Max style apocalypse or a utopian vision of uh, separating our consumption from nature uh, as the Breakthrough Institute would have it. But back to uh, my main point, we hear across each of these papers how rhetorics are deployed by powerful stakeholders to influence broader publics to accept the status quo. But beyond that, even many of our alleged alternatives to fossil fuels aren't really all that alternative in important ways and don't challenge other structures of power and forms of injustice. And so, as the After Oil Research Group argues, identifying these taken-for-granted rhetorics can be a first step in triggering intentional transitions where global stakeholders are fully aware of their options and so are able to make tough decisions for themselves. So this discussion of materiality and ethics comes to a final set of questions that I have for us all, uh, which has to do with how we might see our work as religion and nature scholars as not just improving knowledge about the world, but also as contributing to the needs of the communities that we work with. 
So we've used religion to understand the political strategies involved in energy discourse. Uh, we've built ourselves tools to analyze the ethical dimensions of any extractive industry, whether that's the en energy industry or the scholarly industry. But now what? Uh, what place do we as scholars play as members of broader communities hoping to bring about change? It's always important for us to talk amongst ourselves like this, uh, but how can this type of meeting become not just an opportunity to share and debate ideas, but also an opportunity to strategize about how we can help the communities that we care about? How can religion and nature scholarship and pedagogy become more of a public focused tool for change? As these papers have demonstrated, the voices in favor of ongoing resource extraction are powerful and well organized, and people like Mark Epstein with his moral case for fossil fuels and the Cornwall Alliance are out there arguing that modern fossil fuel capitalism is actually the most just way of addressing issues of poverty around the world. So how do we counter that if that's exactly what we want to do? So I'll just conclude with a quote from Adrian Avakov in his reflection on the very first ISSRNC conference uh, way back in 2006. Uh, and this was later published in uh, the first issue of the JSRNC in 2007. Uh, but he wrote, the main contribution of this association should be to pool our knowledge in a way that would provide intellectual support through disseminating information, facilitating collaboration, instigating organization and action, and hopefully being called on to inform decision making for larger social and activist efforts. So how well have we done that as a society over the last 16 or 17 years, and what more can we do? So I'll end there, and I think we have a little bit more time for Q&A for the panelists. So thank you, everybody. Hello. Hi, thank you guys. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I loved all your papers and the response um, was excellent as well. Um, I just, I had a question for Dr. Brunson. Um, since you're doing ethnography and I've been talking with a bunch of folks of us who do ethnography or ethnographic-ish work, um, and I am wondering how you feel about um, being there in the field when you have this kind of critical perspective in the back of your mind and how just wondering about that experience how you either deal with it maybe not in scholarship or otherwise but or else how you write about it how you I mean what do you do when you have kind of this disconnect between how they're seeing it and you and when you come face to face with people it's so different and you see how it power you know it's so important in their lives and I also live in oil country and I understand that as part of people's existence in a way that's difficult to you know it's a lot easier to criticize when it's not not part of your like family legacy and stuff so i, I wondered how you think about that uh that's a really generous question uh, and it's funny actually i was speaking with a group of people who don't do this kind of work and they asked me that right away too they're like you're clearly critical of them and what's interesting is i don't know if i am uh, you know what i mean like i i think i'm critical of like oil corporations but I'm not sure if a, a given person's decision to work in the oil industry is ever like under scrutiny in my work in a way that maybe is like a moral lack <laughs> in my work generally. Um, but I think that was the kind of sense, it was something that was challenging to navigate in the field, mostly, uh, and I'm actually, I'm writing something for Amanda <laughs> about this, but there is this kind of defensiveness as well. When I say like, oh, I'm interested in oil culture, folks are like, oh, well, then they have the things they wanna say, right? They say, we do clean energy. It's unlike other places. People need energy. Do the people not think they use energy? It's my job to do this. I need to feed, my, you know, they go through the thing and I'm like, oh, okay. But like, what does it feel like to work here? And I think in some ways for me, the ethnographic moment allows for more than like necessarily an interview in that context, like hanging out with these people, thinking about their life, asking questions about their life more generally, allows access to this in a way than just, more than just asking questions about oil might. Um, so that's how I've kind of navigated it. I, I felt like in some cases there was this kind of like evangelical kind of in engagement, right? People were like, well, what do you think about oil? Tell me now before this conversation begins. But that actually happened like not as many times as I thought it would. Um, and in some cases, they read me quite clearly as someone who like maybe would not be on board with the same kind of ideas of energy transition that they would. But in some ways, 
we're then working to convert, right? So in some ways that also played into the ethnographic moment where they're like, let me show you how this works, let me show you how clean the energy is, let me show you how these things work. Um, and in some ways that comes out in the project, but some ways it doesn't. So I think to, I answer that in the most long-winded way possible, very woolly, but for me, I did try as a commitment in this project, and maybe this isn't the right commitment in all projects, to not have the moral, personal, religious, I guess, if we understand oil as a religion, being in that, working in that industry as a moral question or not. Um, and for me, the, the theorist that guided me with that is Alexis Stockwell, who writes about a book called Against Purity, in which we have to kind of understand our bad kin as kin um, in the same way that we can't just like cut out uh, people whose beliefs are different than ours because of um, the way their beliefs add to our inevitable demise. <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope that helped, but uh, for me, uh, working against purity as if I might be able to write something more pure than their thinking is not where I try to or originate my, my thinking. <gasps> Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for these papers. Um, Amanda, I've got a question about your fantastic paper and presentation. Um, I found myself, as I was listening to you, trying to figure out what the relationship was between the aesthetics of Isabel Boemka's self-presentation and nuclear energy. It's like, go nuclear, fossil fuel is terrible, and look at this picture of me in front of my phone, in front of my phone, in front of my phone. Like, what, how do those things, two things relate to one another? Um, and uh, I, the best I can do, and I'm wondering if you thought about this, is like the, there's something about desire happening in these presentations, it seems, in her presentations. Um, another confessional moment, I found myself listening to you being like, but I want so badly to believe in nuclear energy. Like, I want to believe in something. I want to believe that it's clean. I, when she says, it's clean and we can store it, I want to be like, yes, great, can you? Maybe you know more than I do. Like, is this an infinite uh, sort of amount of clean and fantastic? Like, I want that, right? And then I, I think I'm supposed to want her in some sort of way, right? So, but, and, and you know, I, I, she's not my gender. I don't like that, that. That's not my particular, you know, thing. But, um, but is that what's happening? Is she playing into some kind of desire to believe and desire to have? And is that like how do you how do you connect those two major elements of this uh, this campaign? Yeah, that's thanks. That's a really those are really great questions. Um, so kind of to start from the beginning, if I understood what you were asking exactly. So she plays on this hyper-futuristic persona um, to try to sell the idea that nuclear is the future. Nuclear is the perspective that we want to go to. It's the, the method that we want to use to get to this idealized utopian vision of a cool interplanetary creature that like can go to Mars and it's all going to be fueled by nuclear and it's going to be our salvation to like protect humans specifically, it's a very anthropocentric narrative that she's selling, um, to protect them on the, this planet, but also to enable them to expand beyond this planet. And it is, it's based on desire, certainly, and you've picked up on the, like, that we also want, she wants us to desire her. She is a model, like, that is her background. And so there is some kind of hypersexuality about the way she dresses and the way she like fetishizes nuclear energy as the potential for the future. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of desire worked into it and built into the narrative. Um, I want to get into that more as I continue. This is fairly new material. This TED talk just dropped like, Braun sent it to me the morning that I sat down to write my abstract for this conference. So this is how new the, the stuff is. So I'm really getting into this right now and that's part of the broader paper that I had to trim pretty dramatically for here. It is also built on this like science is cool thing that the de-extinction group is really working on. 
Um, and Lisa and I have had some conversations about the science is cool and uh, techno scientific futures is cool. So I, I want to work that stuff in too. But yeah, that's. I'm not sure. What that means. Uh, I, want, I want to thank all of the panelists for wonderful papers. Um, my question goes back to how you theorize um, each of these um, topics. For example, um, Evan talked about energy imaginaries um, as well as the political ontologies, whereas Judith spoke more about energy epistemologies um, within industrial and American religion. And then finally, um, Amanda talked about uh, the type of, of mythologizing that uh, Isidote does. And I noticed, I, I didn't realize how much she taps into goddess memes. She actually presents herself as a nuclear, clean energy kind of goddess. A deity. And deity, yeah. yeah. So, so I guess I'm just interested more in, in uh, how you theoretically engaged uh, oil extraction. You want to take this one and have the last one? Sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick about it because we are running up against the clock. Um, yeah, I use, I use ontologies instead of epistemologies here because I think what I'm trying to do is to think not just about how we know uh, oil and gas, but to think about how that knowledge then gets built into the architecture of particular kinds of extractive industries, right? So it's, I appreciated about uh, Dr. Witt's remarks that, that that step, like how we're, each of these papers is attempting to move from rhetorics or discourses or epistemologies into sort of enacted policies and infrastructures and, and ways of life in a more concrete sense. All of us are trying to make that move. So exactly the terms on which we're making it, I think are, are slightly secondary to the fact that we're, we're trying to scale up from the merely theoretical into the uh, sort of the actualizing processes that, that happen around these extractive industries. Yeah. Yeah. Other people want to jump in? I'll just say that's a very important question, and I actually don't know what I'm doing. Like, I, uh, I, th I was so convinced by Evan's energy uh, ontologies that I was like, yeah, maybe I should just stick with ontologies. Like, maybe that's the best way. But uh, Tara Daggett uses epistemologies, and I like how she's kind of shifting that. There's kind of a bridging with the environment of humanities in that term. I, in my own work, actually use cosmologies mostly, because I think that this is in part uh, an imagining of land that shapes um, people, not just being as in a human activity, but a, a, an idea of place and universe. So I am still shopping uh, for the term, but I do, I can't, I actually mostly use cosmologies. Actually, I, 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 I like Irina's not here because she's presiding, but she's also like, maybe it should be ontology. So this is like an ongoing discussion. I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts about if this is epistemology, an ontology, a cosmology, or a meme. Cosmologies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're out of time, so I think we're going to wrap up. So thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you.